Well, it's good to see everyone this morning after this long winter break. Um, to those who are joining us for the first time, welcome to our worship and ministry series. This year in the worship and ministry series, we are covering this wonderful topic, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And we see these three mentioned in the Bible repeatedly. It wasn't that these ones were anything special, but what was special was what God did in them. The experiences and the journeys God took these three men through so that they can become God's people and God could become their God in the most subjective and intimate way. And so last semester, if you had joined us, you would have known when we were covering the God of Abraham, Abraham learned to live a life in faith. He was called by God. He had to learn to trust in God. He was called God's friend. He was so intimate with God. And then eventually at the very end of last semester, we saw how Isaac is a picture of how today we, as New Testament believers, can enjoy Christ the Son. Everything we have received in our Christian life, whatever grace, whatever mercy, is all from Christ. And today, God has put us in Christ. So Isaac's life, when you read through it, his life was so uneventful. He was just a restful person, peaceful, enjoying God's grace. Well, Brothers and sisters, that brings us to a new semester. And now we are coming. We're making a transition at the middle of the book of Genesis. The very middle, chapter 25, we come to the life of Jacob. And if you've ever read Genesis before, you will know any reader of the Bible cannot fail to find a great difference between the life of Isaac and the life of Jacob. Isaac, so simple. And yet when we come to Jacob, oh, the struggles he had. Oh, the conflict. Oh, when you get to Jacob's life, oh, it's just a mess. <laughs> oh, the, the kind of experiences he had, the dealings. Well, dear brothers and sisters, this morning, I must have to, I have to tell you, Actually, we are all a Jacob. <laughs> I just have to bring that out right now. You just consider your Christian experience. Has it been so restful? Has it been so peaceful? Or is your Christian life marked by turmoil, inner struggles? You want to love the Lord. You want to be absolute. But it just seems like you run away from the Lord. The Lord doesn't seem so real. And so we need the experiences, not just of Abraham and Isaac, but also Jacob, to become God's people. And so this morning, I'm going to share specifically on the beginning of Jacob's life, how he was chosen by God, and how he was dealt with by God. The most I feel one of the most interesting people in the Bible, Jacob. Okay, so I'll just begin by reading the story. Um, this is, uh, you know, Isaac, his father, and Rebecca, his mother. It was said that Rebecca's womb was barren, and so Isaac entreated God for a child, and Rebecca became pregnant. But at that time of pregnancy, it says there were two within her. Two children struggled within her. And she said, if it is so, why am I like this? And she went to inquire of Jehovah. So this is what God said. God said, two nations are in your womb. Two peoples shall be separated from your bowels. The one people shall be stronger than the other people. And the older shall serve the younger. And so eventually, as we read on, there were twins in her womb. 
the first one that came forth was red all over like a hairy garment. His name was called Esau. And the second brother, he was holding on to Esau's heel, so his name was called Jacob. Okay, I just paused there. I'd like to tell you right now what Jacob's name means. In Hebrew, Jacob, when Isaac and Rebekah saw the children come out of the, mother, the mother's womb, they saw one child coming out first and the second one holding on to the heel. And so they called his name Jacob. It means heel holder. <laughs> Another word, it means supplanter. And I had to look this up. Do you know what the word supplanter means? One who supplants? It's one who undermines, one who usurps, one who cheats, takes advantage of. And so even from before Jacob was born, you can see the kind of person he was, <laughs> right? Crafty, wicked. Actually, at the end of Jacob's life, he would admit to God and to those around him, I'm an evil person. That's the kind of person we're talking about now. Okay, but don't laugh at Jacob so much. We have to realize we're also Jacob's, okay? So don't laugh at him so much. We will see. Okay, so again, Genesis 25, 23. It says, the older shall serve the younger. Actually, God had already chosen Jacob. He had determined that Esau would serve Jacob. So how does this apply to us? Before Jacob was even born, God had chosen him. And it tells us in Ephesians 1.4, God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. Did you realize God chose you before you were even born? Actually, according to this verse, before God even created anything in Genesis 1, he chose each and every one of you. Wow. I, I can't wrap my head around that. It's just too unfathomable. Yeah, before we were born, before God even created anything, he chose you. And so in Romans 9, 11 through 13, it will tell us, though the children had not done anything good or bad, right? Esau and Jacob, before they were even born, that the purpose of God, according to selection, might remain, not of works, but of him who calls. Doesn't matter the kind of person you are. It's God who chose you. God who calls you. And it was said to her, the greater shall serve the less. Jacob indeed was the less, right? I would not choose Jacob, would you? If you were God, would you choose Jacob? If you were... Uh, picking someone to be your friend, would you choose Jacob? I would not want him to be anywhere within a mile from me. Uh, I wouldn't want him to be my friend. I definitely would not want him to be my brother. But it says in Romans 9, 13, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Do you realize that? God chose Jacob. And he didn't choose Esau. Um, you know, okay, maybe I'll just read this first. In Romans 9.16, it continues in this chapter. So then it's not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. I, uh, at a certain point when I became a zealous believer, I began to love the Lord. I just thought I was the most burning brother, the most on fire for the Lord. I was so proud. But then eventually God had to come in and speak to me. This verse. Yeah, it's not of us. Not you who will. Not you who run. But God who shows mercy. It's altogether God's mercy that he chose Jacob. And it's altogether God's mercy that he chose us. And I'd just like to inspire us all this morning concerning God's choosing of you. 
you know, sometimes when I just reflect on my life up until now, I just have to worship God, how he chose me. Ah, uh, you know, okay, you've all been reading 1 Corinthians. That's the Bible study we've been in. Chapter 1, it tells us that God might shame the strong, he would choose the weak. You know, it was said that Jacob, physically, he wasn't that strong. When he was born, it says he grew up, he was a quiet man dwelling in tents. And his brother Esau was a hunter of the field, strong, right? Hairy, red, that's why he was. The name Esau, Edom, means red. And also God, to shame the wise, would choose the foolish. Jacob thought he was so clever. He always tried to come out as number one, but the more he tried to be number one, the more he came in last place. You will see. Not just in the womb when he came out, but all throughout Jacob's life, just, ah, oh, God had to deal with him, putting him in last place. And I just remember, there was a, I just remember his name just now. I was thinking of his name this whole week in middle school, a guy named Sam Burkett. <laughs> oh, he was so good at basketball. And no matter how hard I tried to beat him, I just couldn't do it. And he dashed my dream of becoming an NBA superstar. <laughs> uh, I just remembered his name. I was thinking about it all week long. <laughs> and then in high school, there was someone named Kevin Sun. Okay, my name is Kevin Sun, but I have a G at my last name. He doesn't have a G. <laughs> S-U-N, Kevin Sun. And it came out in the newspaper one day. Kevin Sun, exceptionally talented pianist, received a 2400 on his SAT. That was back when the SAT was out of 2400. Is this still? It's not, right? Yeah. And so uh, I think Felicia, I grew up with her. She's in the kitchen. Uh, she saw the newspaper, and she came to me one day and said she congratulated me. And I, <laughs> <laughs> I had to admit it's not me. And so you just consider your life brothers and sisters, how many people around you, better than you, right? Smarter, stronger, and yet God chose you. God chose me. When I think about that, oh, I just have to worship God. What a God have we? Who am I? <laughs> who, are, who are you? But God chose us. Okay. Coming back to Romans 9-11, I want to focus on this, that the purpose of God according to selection. Did you realize God chose us with a purpose? God's choosing of us is not aimless. From the time before creation, God's choosing was with a purpose in mind. And so it tells us in Romans 8 that we were chosen to be conformed to the image of God's Son. God's choosing of us was with a destiny that we would express Christ. That's his purpose for every believer. It says that he who God has chosen, he whom God has called, whom God has justified, he also God has glorified. So I must tell you this morning, no matter what you think you are, your condition, no matter if you think you're like Jacob, you think you're not up to standard, well, let me tell you, your destiny is set. You will be a glorified son of God. And so Jacob, he, in his life, God had to do so many things to deal with him, to break him. But eventually, God had a way to gain Jacob. 
and he changed his name to Israel. Israel means prince of God. Amen. This pitiful supplanter, vile sinner, God had a way to work on him and to gain him, to make him into a royal prince of God. Amen. And we will come to this later this semester. At the end of Jacob's life, you realize what a noble, what a lovely, what a sweet person Jacob became. So that's our destiny, brothers and sisters. God will gain us. We have to have faith. Okay, are you clear? I'm a, a little bit worried this morning that you're not all certain you're chosen. I mentioned you're chosen. If you've believed in the Lord, that means you're a chosen one. But I'd like to ask you all this morning, how do you know you're chosen? Anyone? How do you know you're chosen? Daniel? I ask God. You ask God? Mm -hmm. Okay. Anyone else? I'm not looking for a doctrinal answer. Don't tell me the Bible tells me so. <laughs> I want something from your experience. How do you know you're chosen? Lord is using us and Ali. Because I've experienced his mercy, I've, I've felt his, his spirit and mind. Uh -huh. Theo? Uh, maybe a third. We know we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Okay. And hopefully I love the brothers, but I feel like that's my experience. You always love the brothers? Not, 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 wow, Theo. No, 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 no. no, 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 no. <laughs> It's just encouraging. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. Well, I will give you my answer. It's not, a, it's not the right answer, but it's my experience. How I know I've been chosen is because I cannot run away. Even the fact that you're here this morning means God is so jealous over you that he chose you. And I'd like to bring to us a psalm. And this psalm has come back to me time and time again. It's touched me throughout my Christian life. Psalm 139, the psalmist says, Where shall I go away from your spirit? And where shall I flee from your presence? Have we ever had the thought, I just want to run away. I don't want to be a Christian anymore. It's too much. Lord, I just don't want to love you anymore. It's too much. The psalmist says, If I ascend into heaven, there you are. If I make my bed in Sheol, that's hell, there you are. Doesn't matter where we try and run. And I tell you, many times in my Christian life, I try to run away from God. But the more I try to run away, the more I discover right where I ran to, there he was. My goodness. <clears throat> If I take the wings of the dawn and settle at the limits of the sea, I know a brother in Southern California, literally to run away from his Christian parents. He was so sick of them giving him Bible verses, telling him to go to Christian meetings. He literally went to the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And his mission in life was to save planet Earth through marine conservation and scuba diving. <laughs> well, you know, the verse says, there also your hand will lead me. Your right hand will take hold of me. Eventually, the Lord came to that brother in such a sweet and precious way, and now he's serving the Lord. Wow. Then, Psalm 139, 11 and 12, if I say, Surely darkness will cover me, and the light around me will be night. Have you ever had that kind of experience? You just don't want God to know where you are. You want him to leave you alone. God, I'm in darkness. God, I'm in the night. Don't bother me. Then God, the psalmist says, he realized, 
Even the darkness is not dark to you. Can you believe it? To God, your darkness is nothing because he chose you. Night shines like day. The darkness is like the light. That's the kind of God we have. He's not worried about what you do, about how far you run, because he's chosen you. How about let's read 139, 13, and 17 all together. For it was you. Yeah. So even before Jacob was born, God formed him. God knew the kind of person he would be. And in 139, 17, the psalmist couldn't help but worship God. How precious are your thoughts to me, O God. How great is the sum of them. You know, when you read Jacob's life, so much attention, so much attention is paid to the details of his life. Did you know Jacob's life covers almost half of the book of Genesis? Well, you know, that's a little window of how much our God cares for us, how much his thoughts in his heart, he's for us. The psalmist says, his thoughts are more numerous than the sand on the seashore toward each one of us. That's the kind of God we have. Are you convinced? Are you assured? I hope you're assured this morning. God has chosen you, and he will not let you go. Um, okay, well, time is running out, but I do have to, to lay the foundation for the brother next week to share. I have to talk a little bit more about Jacob's life, how he was dealt with. And here I have a verse, Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. And so we know all things work together for good. I don't know if Jacob knew all the struggles he had, but let me tell you, uh, eventually all things will work together for good and that's because God has called us for a purpose, to make us a royal son of God, a royal prince of God. And so when you read in Genesis 25, Esau was hunting. He comes back from the field, and he's faint. He's tired. But he's a careless young man. He says to Jacob, Jacob's cooking a red stew. He says, let me eat some of that stew. And Jacob, you see a little bit of Jacob's evil nature here. He says, first, sell me your birthright. <laughs> first, sell me your birthright. And Esau agrees. That planted another seed of hatred between these two brothers. Then in chapter 27, we have Jacob and here we really see how God worked all things together for good. Every person in Jacob's family worked for his good. Isaac, his father, so simple-minded. He said in his old age, I just want a tasty meal. So he told Esau, go and hunt and prepare for me a tasty meal and I will bless you. Isaac was so simple. And then Rebecca, the mother, she was capable and she was manipulative. You can tell which one Jacob got his genes from. Her name means ensnarer. She heard Isaac say that and she went quickly to Jacob and said, Jacob, Isaac's about to bless your brother. I'm, this is what we're going to do. I'm going to put your brother's clothes on you. We're going to go kill a lamb from the flock. Put the skin on your hand. Because remember, Esau was hairy. <laughs> and you're going to go in, give him this tasty meal, and you're going to receive the blessing. And so that's what Jacob does. 
supplanted his brother again. And when Esau comes back and finds out what Jacob did, he said, Is his name not rightly called Jacob? For he has supplanted me these two times. And Esau was angry. He said, The days of my father's passing are soon, and when he passes, I'm going to slay my brother Jacob. And again, Rebekah hears. Uh, by the way, it was said that Isaac loved Esau because Esau had a taste for game. But Rebekah loved Jacob. Jacob was mommy's boy, <laughs> right? Mommy's favorite. He was a spoiled brat, literally. <laughs> and so what Rebekah had to do was tell Jacob, run away. Run away to your uncle Laban and return once your brother's fury has passed away. And so you just get a glimpse in this chapter, everything that worked together for good. You know, when God calls us, it's often not in a very pleasant situation. Jacob was forced to leave the comfort of his parents' home so that he could meet God. So this morning, I must leave you all with a cliffhanger. What happens after Jacob runs away? Come next week to find out.